Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we explore what it means to be a well-rounded, happy, goal-crushing athlete. Every week, myself, sports journalist Molly Herford, and cycling coach and kinesiologist Peter Glassford interview experts and chat through all of your training questions. We're excited to have you along for the ride. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. My wife has returned after being away for several days. Yes, so far away. I was out in California for sea otter. If you've been following our Instagram, I was posting about some of the uh, sort of trends that I was seeing out there. It sort of seems like e-bike everything, a lot of iridescent, a lot of Hawaiian-inspired print shirts. Okay. Very loud. I've seen that in the gravel scene. Very loud. Your father also seemed impressed. Yeah, I feel like my dad has been trolling me on Instagram lately, too. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I I mentioned something about eating fries in Santa Cruz, and he's like, "Uh, those are actually fish and chips, Molly. So if anyone wants to see David Herford just being ruthless, uh, make sure you're following at Consummate Athlete and at Molly J. Herford over on Instagram. But yeah, how was your, uh, your bachelor weekend with DW? It was good. A lot of courses. Yeah, this is uh, just doing a couple extra courses this weekend. So lots of computer time and then an in-person one today to start the week. So yeah, it's good spring, I guess. Keeping up to date. Good, good. So this episode is actually kind of a funny one timing wise because uh, I we have Dr. Sean Allen on and she's all about... Uh, I'm going to just quote her Twitter here, blending data, science, tech, and art to answer human performance questions. So she's basically an expert sports scientist. She's worked with some of the highest level athletes in the world. She's done a ton of research, uh, in particular around wearable technology. And the whole, like a lot of our conversation is around the idea of wearables and what information is useful, what information is, you know, just kind of data overload or is just not really serving us. Uh, And what I found really funny about posting it this week is that uh, going out to Sea Otter, I actually took off all of my wearables. I took off, I'm working on an article where I'm wearing all the wearables uh, to kind of talk about the objective versus subjective data. Um, But to head to Sea Otter, I was like, no CGMs, no aura ring, no whoop, because you know what? I know what they're going to say, and it's not going to be anything that I want to hear. Like, I am very aware that I need to sleep more. And that, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have that, you know, dinner out with people. But I was also aware that I was going to do those things. Mm -hmm. There's a whole host of things. And and I think I directed, I had been following uh, Sean for a while here. And uh, yeah, it just seemed like she was really well balanced on some of these intricacies of, you know, just to your point, like the context matters so much. And, and when you need the feedback, do you want the feedback? Does it change your experience of what you're doing? Does it make you second guess things that you might do otherwise, you know, the best you can in that context? And then the whole host of issues and, and concerns and questions around hardware, like, is it, it does your watch actually measure anything, you know, accurately? Uh, and then whenever it's measuring, is it actually relevant? Uh, it is also a concern, right? Like maybe it does measure, you know, CGMs would be an example, right? Does, does it even matter, you know, what blood sugar is for the, the, the healthy person or, uh, you know, during exercise or these things, right? We still don't really, the answer still isn't clear. So there's all these things when we're talking about wearables, as far as accuracy and reliability and validity and all these, these words. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I mean, what's interesting, one thing we talked about is like, I actually sometimes get a little annoyed with wearables because my dad is actually pretty good like i'm not really having any like issues nothing's coming nothing's really getting red flagged uh you know sometimes i'll I'll do blood work and everything's good or like when i was using the cgm i didn't really have that many like wild spikes and she was like yeah molly that's a good thing like you you actually want your data to be super boring i hear that from clients sometimes with hrv and and these things and and marco altini who we've had on the podcast a few times from hrv for training which we love uh you know there's a few ways to help with that but yeah like i mean the thing is when someone's very fit you know the cardiovascular system is pretty good at dealing with things in the autonomic i guess more technically the autonomic nervous system Um, so sometimes it's not that you're not even disrupted. It's just like, you know, sitting up in your bed and and taking your heart rate isn't really stressing this cardiovascular system. 
uh, in the way that it might in someone else. So you might not see these microscopic changes until, you know, the person's in really rough shape, perhaps. So uh, again, this is, you know, is it the right thing for every person is, is the question, right? Maybe mm-hmm. for your average population, maybe some of these things do work. And, and so again, this is this is the, the mess that we have with wearables currently is figuring out what, what actually might help for you and your goals. Yeah, exactly. So we really, we really dug into all of that. And I think it's a really interesting conversation, whether you are using a wearable already or you're, you know, wearable curious. Uh, so definitely, you know, keep listening and, and just do a little bit of thinking. We have, we also have a couple like suggestions for, uh, what to do before actually buying a wearable, sort of the, the questions to ask yourself things to think about. Uh, so I thought that was super helpful. Um, but before we get into that, I mean, as far as fit tech goes, one sponsor that we have to give just a ton of credit to is inside tracker. That's so, right. I mean, it's not even that high tech. They're just taking blood, but what's high tech is their, their interface, right? We really like how their, their website all brings it in together and gives you the power to get blood work when you, when you might want it. Yeah. And that's a conversation I've been having with a lot of different companies in sort of the fit tech space lately. I mean, even when you're talking about these wearables, a lot of this concept is just opening up this information information that was previously kind of left to the discretion of your doctors. I mean, even when you're talking about CGMs, and especially when you're talking about blood work and big blood panels, like it used to be you had to go to your doctor and pretty much beg them for a requisition, especially up here in Canada, to, you know, just get a few biomarkers. I know I've definitely struggled with our family doctor just to get any basic blood work done because I appear pretty healthy. So he's like, yeah, you're probably fine. Um, so being able to go to Inside Tracker and actually get a, you know, huge, like, just get all of the blood work. <laughs> you know, they're, they're checking 40, over 40 biomarkers, uh, you know, from your magnesium, your vitamin D, your testosterone, your cortisol, your ferritin, pretty much all of the major markers that athletes and just healthy people in general kind of need to be paying attention to. And a bonus, they come to your house and do it if you choose the mobile blood draw. Right. And I cannot stress enough how amazing that is sure yeah and it is you know it, 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 it costs money right i think for canadians sometimes this is, is off-putting because our healthcare is universal yes uh, you know free you could say but universal in that you know that's where it's sometimes hard to get the blood work and then for a lot of busy people you know that trip to the the lab the hospital whatever and you know is is a lot of money you're not at work earning perhaps or mm-hmm. child care or whatever so the the home draw is, is just great you know they can come right in the morning uh so you can do a fasted blood work but you don't have to drive all the way to the doctors and sit in the waiting room and everything else yeah and i like the ability you know you can get all of the results in a couple different formats they have a really nice app that shows you everything you can get a nice pdf that actually has all of your uh you know what your levels are and then any recommendations for you and with the recommendations i appreciate that you can toggle on and off supplements so if you toggle it off it's just lifestyle stuff And then if you toggle it on, it's like, okay, these supplements might be helpful, which Mm -hmm. I really appreciate. And you can actually export it all as like a CSV and then send it right to your doctor. Or if you're a tech spreadsheet person, you could track all your your numbers from past work as well. So you can send it to your doctor, send it to your coach, which is something actually that Sean and I talk about later in the episode is like this, you know, bringing your technology, like putting that stuff in the coach's hands, not just you looking at these apps. So I think it's really helpful. Like I send it to my coach all the time. My doctor has it. And then they can even requisition like follow up blood work for one or two markers if there are a couple things that are off, mm-hmm. which is super helpful. Mm-hmm. So, and I will say our doctor actually uses like, when we give it to him, but the, the inside tracker interface the dashboard where because they have all the blood work and you can input all other blood work you might have as well from a csv or something as well right or by hand uh if it's just papers you have uh but yeah it's a really nice color-coded you know interface so it's 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 great yes and for a limited time you can get 20 percent off the entire inside tracker store when you sign up at inside tracker.com bat backslash consummate so that's inside tracker.com backslash c-o-n-s-u-m-m-a-t-e and we'll have that link in the show notes so if you're ready to get a crystal clear picture of what's going on inside your body along with science-backed recommendations to optimize what's not working perfectly then visit inside tracker.com backslash consummate all right let's get into our episode before dw eats the entire desk as he is currently trying to do enjoy this chat with sean allen well, let's let's sort of just get right into it. I mean, first, just like explain to me how you got to to where you are today. Your whole like career slash sport background. Like, were you super athletic growing up? How did you end up working with the New Zealand swim team? Like, how does this come about? 
Yeah, sure. I guess I was. I loved sport growing up. I um, had a couple of brothers, so that probably helped. I played football, soccer in the UK. I was playing in the, the Women's Premier League. And at that time, it wasn't professional at all. And and so I thought, oh, I need to sort of get a job in, instead of becoming a pro footballer. And the closest thing to that was going into sports science. So I studied sports science in my undergrad and then exercise physiology as a master's. And then I got a job out of that working with the British swimming team in the lead up to the London 2012 Olympics as a performance scientist. And so a lot of what I would do with the team there was go poolside before training and take a lot of measurements from the athletes to monitor their training status. And that was basically the measurements that a lot of these kind of wearable devices take for us now automatically. So I would take a blood sample to look at morning glucose. I would measure their resting heart rate, heart rate variability, do a questionnaire to look at sleep quality, that kind of thing. Oh, wow. And from so that, you we were, were looking doing, at the data. Like you were the wearable. It was you. <laughs> Like, oh yeah well yeah I mean that's what the a lot of the the role of a physiologist with a professional kind of sports team or top athletes still is to, to this day like gathering a lot of that data and sort of going through it I think what the devices now allow you to do is just to spend more time looking at the data which is as I was acquiring this data I started to realize wow there's so much here and I think it's useful but I don't necessarily know how just yet what I need to do is like get a deeper understanding of how to look at this data and how to make sense of it And so that prompted me to move to New Zealand, which is where I did my PhD. And I was looking at kind of data analytics and how to understand these kind of data while still working with the New Zealand swimming team, collecting data from them, sort of studying with the athletes and trying to make sense of all all this data and how to use it to help athletes kind of improve their, their training and performance. I love that. And I think that's actually, I would say, still a pretty big problem today where now we have all of these wearables where we're collecting all of this data but I think very few of us actually know like how to do anything with it or actually like action it, right? Like if my, you know, if my aura ring says I didn't sleep very well, but I I thought I slept pretty well, or like I had, you know, I did the cool, the dark, the like, you know, no sound, white noise machine, all the things. Like, what what do I actually kind of do with any of that data? And I mean, for for you, like that, I guess going back even further, like you would just have like all of this, like all of the numbers, all of the inputs, but none of the like, okay, but what does it all mean? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so much of that is captured, I think, in the nuance or the detail or the context around a person or an athlete, which these devices often aren't just aren't set up to capture. And so you almost have to have a conversation with them about it. And so how we would think about using the data, at least on a day-to-day basis, was looking at trends looking at perhaps when a value is above someone's normal normal range and then use that to have a conversation with them and say hey something's up here did you do anything differently yesterday what did you do let's go through it and then through that conversation you might figure out oh well this happened perhaps that was related maybe try doing this the next day which these devices aren't set up to do something like that right now so i think potentially what what we're seeing and the problem that many people are probably facing is the hardware is much better than the software in terms of it there's an ability to measure lots of things but then you don't have that like human coach sort of holding your hand and helping you figure it out and you're expected to kind of figure it out yourself or with some kind of generic recommendations from the app which I think the education piece is the bit that is going to get better and needs to get better to help these things really become useful for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the big things to me that's missing is the ease of putting in any of the contextualizing data. So, you know, the ability to very quickly put in, yes, I had a drink last night. Like there are a couple of the apps, like I'll say the HRV for training one, when it pops up in the, that one's only based on a morning reading, but it does pop up a list of things. And one of them is like, did you have alcohol? Now, granted, mm-hmm. it goes from none to a little to too much. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm always like, sort of like, how do I tell? I can say <laughs> a little or too much. Like, what's like healthy medium? I don't know. <laughs> it's a very odd one, but at least that gives you it. The other ones, you really have to dig in to like, kind of find out where you can like journal any details. So you actually like, it's hard to add your own notes to a lot of them, which makes it hard to then look back and say, oh, huh, drinking, right, bad for recovery. Yeah, exactly. So you almost have to do it yourself at this point. You can get separate apps that allow you to do that. One I know is called Bearable. And that one allows you to enter like all number of tags. I think it's made more specifically for people with like health 
concerns and then they can track behaviors that lead to flare-ups but potentially also useful for athletes as well Um, so I think that there's like things happening in this space it's just a matter of time until they join the dots but again the other thing that also isn't happening right now necessarily early is the connections between that context and changes or trends in in the data and so Mm -hmm. that's another thing I always encourage people to look at not to be too reactive to the day-to-day values but more to look at the trends over time and see like consistently if you've done this behavior do you then see a follow-on effect on your sleep HRV whatever it is and Mm -hmm. there's just more kind of robustness in those trends and some of the day-to-day values because sometimes I think one of the things that also isn't explained very well to perhaps people who don't necessarily have like a, a PhD in this area is that there can be error in these measurements. Oh my gosh. So yeah. You might say like, oh, my heart rate's gone up loads. Like, like something's up and it's like, okay, well, you know, how much of that is error of measurement or is it kind of an artifact related to like an arrhythmia in your heartbeat or something like that? You know, there's just a lot of these like nuances and details that you mm-hmm. often need like an expert or a coach to help walk you through and just having the app like it's it's good to, to some extent but then to get that like real personalized useful actionable feedback there are just limitations right now yeah yeah for sure and i think we now have like several wearables like right now for for this article i'm working on i'm wearing you know an aura and sometimes a whoop and i have a cgm in like which means i have so many inputs coming at me that like it's you this is sort of what you were talking about with the the British swim team when you first started you know you're doing all of these measurements and stuff and it's like how do you how does one person keep track of all of that stuff for themselves like there's so many things playing into it and just so much like it's a full-time job tracking all of this stuff is what I've found and I am not doing a very good job at it even though I'm like technically it's measuring but I'm not doing anything with it right now (laughs) yeah I think it absolutely can be and you know that's why I think you have to be careful as well because people can become almost obsessed with like making sense of all the variables that it's collecting and worrying about you know one or the other Uh, I think typically if you like if I was working with more of an elite team or elite squad of athletes um, a lot of what I've started to see people doing is using more of a dark mode where you don't see the data back it's sort of hidden And what it will uh, do is either flag like just key variables that have changed a lot outside of your normal range. So pay attention to this, you know, something's something's really up. Um, So that's one way uh, to look at it, that potentially right now you're just seeing everything. (laughs) (laughs) And so that's that can cause like, yeah, it it can take you ages to go through or it can cause like anxiety around it. Um, But, you know, that's something that you have to like, it's not widely available. Again, you mm-hmm. always have to build a UI on top of uh, the data that you're getting or be cautious around, you know, sync it, but don't look at it every day. Just try and look at trends. It's not like readily available for people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, I mean, how much do you think the average master's athlete even really needs to know about themselves? Like one thing I was talking to a dietitian about, we were talking about complaining about wearables. And, you know, she's saying when she was in residency as a dietitian, she was wearing a whoop. And she actually took it off because it kept telling her that her sleep sucked. And she was like, yeah, I know I'm doing a residency right now. Like there's only so much I can do. I'm pretty aware that my sleep is not like optimal. So it's sort of an interesting question for master's athletes. Like how much, how much is it even helping versus just like stressing us out? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's, you have to almost be smart about how you use it. You can't expect it to do all of the work for you because it's obviously not going to actually make changes in your life. And so there are a few things there that might help for people. I mean, one is just deciding what your specific goals are. Like, are you focused on, you know, performance at all costs? Are you more focused on, yeah, improving your sleep or just having enough energy to like play with your kids or go for a ride with someone, you know, just off the cuff, that kind of thing depending on that goal you can pass back a little bit okay these are probably the things I should pay attention to instead of all these other things and stress less about them the other interesting thing that I started to see more of is athletes working more with kind of a sports psychologist to help use these data in the right way and so an example of that might be let's say the day before a race, you sleep badly because you're nervous or you're in a new environment, you've traveled, whatever it is, you get the poor sleep score, you open it up on the day of the race and you think, oh my God, my sleep's really bad. This is going to be awful, but you can't change it. You're still going to do the race. <laughs> so one way to try and potentially handle that is to think about, 
you know, all the other times that you may have slept badly, but actually performed well. And to use the data points to your advantage and to say, actually, I know I've built up some kind of resilience that I can perform well on a bad night of sleep and I have the data to prove it. Mm -hmm. And so to try and work with athletes to use the data they have to help them improve their psychological state, confidence, resilience, whatever it is, rather than just letting them go on that downward spiral of anxiety. And that's obviously, you know, an intimate process in terms of figuring that out for different individuals, depending on how they're wired. But I think there are ways in which we can start to use these data smartly to help us rather than fall into some of these these traps that, you know, readily seem can happen to people. Yeah, yeah. And I would say like the CGM, for instance, is one of the the ones where probably working with a sports psych, if you have any like stress about that at all, I think that's one of the ones where it's really, really useful because I've heard uh there's the dietitian who coined the term uh, glucorexia now, where you have the CGM and you know you're stressing about the spikes, and it's like no, like that's that's life. That's literally how your blood sugar is supposed to work. You eat, it goes up, it goes down, like it happens. Um, but people are you know getting the CGMs without like the context of waviness is normal. That's natural. That's supposed to happen. We don't want a straight line. If it's a flat, flat line, line, like you have a problem. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing to mention with some of these things is that there really haven't been many studies looking at the long term effects of seeing these curves. What does that do for your health or performance in like five years, 10 years? We don't know because we're only just at the kind of inception of getting this data and we haven't looked at it that way. They're more right now people are looking at them from like day to day or week to week. And so we don't actually know whether more of a flat profile or more of a curvy profile in the long term is good or bad. And so there's just like that caveat as well in terms Mm -hmm. of like there are some messages around what's good or what's bad, but it's it's very individual specific. And long term, we don't necessarily know what the best data profile is. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no no need to stress about those things in in the short term. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, your journey with wearables, right? Like, how how has that gone? Like, what have you tried? What have you liked? What haven't you liked? I know you have a very, like, a, treat, a tweet that I'm going to call, like, pretty viral that was wearing the Aura Ring and the Whoop for 12 months and, like, having some pretty interesting results out of that that I very, very much liked on a few things. So give, a, give us your wearable history. Yeah, I guess I have tried to do similar to what you've shared now in terms of wearing several different devices at the same time to look at primarily where the similarities were and where the the differences were, and also to try and understand how they were working in terms of some of the algorithms they were using to just make sense of them in terms of how I would speak to someone else in terms of recommendation based on their goals and those kinds of things. So the experiment that you mentioned, I was wearing the Oop, the Whoop, sorry, the Aura and the Apple Watch at the same time. And I was also taking, trying to take notes on a fairly regular basis in terms of these are things going on in my life. Um, one part of that experiment was me, before I'd opened any of these apps, sitting down with myself and doing a bit of a check-in and saying, how do I think I feel today on a scale of zero to 100? And I'm so excited you said that. comparing <laughs> to try and see like, oh, this is how close it is, or this is how different it is and so that process was really interesting because that was where I started to see some differences that helped me understand how these devices were working in terms of I might feel a lot worse than the apps would say the day or two after an intense weight training session because Mm -hmm. the devices were not capturing that delayed onset muscle soreness that you typically get a few days after a session like that because they just don't have like the sensors to be able to measure those things they're more based on like cardiovascular parameters and Mm -hmm. so there was often a mismatch there that was a key one that I noticed and then on the other end of the spectrum uh, they might say I felt worse than I did let's say when they had problems measuring my sleep for whatever reason Mm -hmm. and so there were just a few discrepancies there were some related to like error of measurement in the device and some related to things that they can't measure and some related to the context I suppose that wasn't going with the numbers. So it just helped me understand, like, I guess the workings of these devices, where the limitations are, where to pay attention to them and where where to pay less attention and think about, you know, these are things that could be improved in the future. Yeah, I love that. I actually was just realizing, so I, I have literally the exact same sort of spreadsheet you described where I have 
my I've been doing like my readiness and my sleep, like yeah. my version of them on a scale of one to 10. And then like Aura's version, then HRV for trainings version, and then whoop score. And then any like notes from the CGM to just sort of see like, yeah, where it's where it's agreeing and where it's not. And the other caveat too, is if you happened to take your wearable off to charge it and say, forgot to bring it with you on like a bike ride or a run, which is what I did the other day, it like, it doesn't know you did it. It has no idea. And in my head, I actually thought like, oh, like the readiness score would be based on how my like HRV actually is. It would be based on these measures that the thing is actually like sensing from my body. But it's actually just also kind of guessing at your workouts and using that to like do the readiness score. So if it doesn't see that I did a workout, it changed the readiness score from what it would do if it had known. So it was yeah, that was definitely one of the other things that I observed in terms of these composite scores. What they're doing is they're melding together in a proprietary formula, your behavior in terms of the workout or the exercise that you did and your response. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, you're not going to get necessarily like clear answers from that. It can, it will just be like a mesh of all of those things versus looking at the, the raw data or the individual metrics themselves, which can be more informative because I guess they're more related to like some of the actual, like you, you're able to separate the behaviors and the response and use that to kind of make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when it, when one of the other things I learned through this experiment was to encourage people to look at those raw data trends rather than these proprietary scores that you know, are harder to interpret because they are a blend of all of these different numbers and you don't necessarily know what that blend is. Yes. Yeah. That's actually in your tweet. You said, beware the readiness and recovery scores. And I was like, yes, I love that. Like it, and it might be very useful for, you know, some, some people for sure. Um, but yeah, definitely. I found like the second I wasn't doing it perfectly and even, even just, it doesn't know me. Like it's, it's guessing that, you know, a, 20 mile run is going to like tank me but I've been you know training for ultras for a long time so that's actually like not that big of a deal it's it, I'm still tired but I'm not like wrecked but because it hasn't been calculating stuff on me for that long it has no idea so it's like oh yeah you should be really tired no I'm yeah fine. it doesn't <laughs> yeah it's not it's not tracking against your baseline really knowing that you've, you've worn it for like a very small proportion of your life or your your training exactly. life I think exactly gen generally speaking these scores will be useful to like a ballpark level so if you are like kind of a novice and you see like a score's high or a score's low you know the, the mm -hmm. directionality is is useful uh so it's probably helpful at that level but when you get to the the level of needing like a bit more specificity around like directing training I think that's where, you know, the kind of the resolution isn't going to be as useful as looking at the raw data and understanding your baseline or your normal and deviations from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if you were working with pro athletes now, are there like, are there wearables that you would suggest versus ones that you definitely wouldn't? Or is that like not a thing that you, you, it like, it would, would it would it depend on who the athlete is? I imagine part of it's dependent on the sport too, because I'm now thinking like weightlifting wouldn't really be great for an aura ring because now you're trying to lift and do stuff with that. So there are, I guess, sport specific constructs too. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of nuances to it. Again, I think if you're, you're, you're doing it as well as you can, it's, it's dependent on your goals. And oftentimes we'd use different things in this to measure performance or response in the sport to performance out of the sport and like the 24 seven monitoring mm -hmm. because of what you mentioned. And also because a lot of sports have regulations such that they don't allow you to wear these things in competition. I saw something in cycling recently about an athlete wearing the CGM and getting disqualified. So an example there. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Oftentimes if you're working with elite athletes, it's you're pretty interested in getting as accurate data as possible during mm -hmm. exercise. So for which case you're often wearing like a chest strap to get your heart rate if that's right. accessible to you in your sport, because that's the most accurate method, even though it's probably less convenient than a ring or a, a wristwatch. So if you're more recreational, you're not so bothered about the accuracy, you want it to be more comfortable. There's I always say there's like this two axis trade off in terms of like the value or the accuracy and then the friction or the burden that comes with it. And so it's almost up to the individual and the use case in terms of like, where are you happy to sit on that continuum? Do you want something to be as easy as possible? So you'll definitely do it. Or do you really need it to be as accurate as possible because you're trying to improve, you know, milli trying to get milliseconds off your time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really depends on who you are 
um, what you're trying to achieve. And then I guess some of the sport specific details as well. But what mm-hmm. I usually say is there's no one device that does everything right now. So yeah. I think that sometimes people are searching for like, what's the one thing I should get? And my answer is typically more nuanced than that. It's, you know, there's, there's some trade-offs, pros and cons. You have to balance those. It's more about like the transparency and understanding what they are. Mm-hmm. And so that's another case where working with a coach or an expert, you know, just a, a human in the loop that can actually help you understand, like, actually, this is probably right for you. And this is the right way to use it rather than the out of the box way that, you know, is prescribed by a company or an app, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think the how to use it, like, it all comes down to like, also, what changes are you willing to make? Uh, sort of to like, you know, I say with the example with the the whoop and my friend who was in residency, like, okay, she can't change her sleep. So maybe exactly. for her, the whoop doesn't even really make sense. Because if that's where she's at right now, like, that's just not going to be a very helpful metric for her to keep getting. And in fact, it's probably going to make her feel terrible about herself all the time, because it's just like, oh, I suck at this. I'm like, yep, still tanked today. Nope, not recovered. Still not recovered. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we always talk about like control the controllables, but obviously that's different for people in different situations and specifically around sleep. You know, it's one of those things where you can't just try harder and sleep better. Yeah. (laughs) And so you almost try harder and you sleep worse. So it almost comes back to what can you control and some of the things that have good evidence around them, which, you know, probably still aren't applicable to your friend, are consistency around uh, sleep and wake time. And then, mm-hmm. you know, designing the right sleep environment, those kinds of things. Like, so it's like try and focus on the things that you can control and almost don't look or don't stress about the things that you can't control, like the process over the outcome as much as possible, which again is almost completely at odds with looking at a data point each day rather than looking at, you know, is there a checklist of like, have you gone through these behaviors? And that's the metric that can reinforce your behavior. In some cases, that's probably more suitable than seeing a specific sleep score that you got. So yeah. that's where the devices are limited right now. Yeah. And I mean, I'd say the other thing there is we all know that those are the good sleep habits. We are, we don't really need something to, to tell us that those are the good sleep habits. So I think what's also interesting to me is using any of this stuff when you haven't nailed what we call like the world-class basics. Like you're not already yeah, doing exactly. sort of some of the the foundationals, whether it's sleep, you know, whether it's, you know, drinking enough water or like just, you know, doing any of that, like doing, you know, consistent training, like as per, you know, a training plan. Um, if you're not doing any of that, it sort of seems like we've kind of almost like jumped a step ahead because measuring stuff seems like more fun than actually doing the the hard stuff like you know eating a salad yeah, occasionally <laughs> exactly I, I i have wondered if like the best use of these devices currently is when, let's say you open the app in the morning and it's almost a nudge to you to check in with yourself on like a list of five questions whatever it is did i set my sleep environment up right last night did i eat enough of the right food did I drink enough water did I manage my life stress those kind of things and because we have this behavior of checking it every day it could perfectly function as that nudge Mm -hmm. and then when you see the data it's almost a prompt just to check in with yourself on those questions and not to judge yourself around you know what what the numbers specifically are and so if there's something fun in the numbers that helps people do that then great I think it's just making sure or trying to find ways to ground it in what you can control and those behaviors and I guess your sense of self in terms of like, yeah, how you feel and how that relates to the number. And Mm -hmm. if there's a gap there, then those questions can probably help you in terms of, you know, what's the difference between these numbers or why is it surprising me? If you come Mm -hmm. back to those basic questions, yeah, you'll probably over time start to see some trends and some things that you really can change. Yeah, yeah. And it does seem like one of the big ones that a lot of the the wearables are pointing to and has been like very popular lately is the like, oh, as it turns out, yes, alcohol, not great for recovery. Who'd have thunk? But uh, (laughs) it does feel like, honestly... When I when I think about it, even for myself, like seeing that data actually come in, like, oh, I didn't sleep as well because I had more than a glass of wine last night. Like that to me actually does make a difference. It definitely makes me like think much more about when I'm pouring that glass of wine or like contemplating a second one. I'm much less likely to go for the second one now because I've seen the like the hard numbers, even though before it's not that I wasn't aware of alcohol's impacts, but seeing it play out on my thing 
definitely has like changed I my... think we I think we all like to think like this doesn't apply to me exactly <laughs> exactly this <laughs> yeah this is this is the the revelation that having your own kind of data can create it's really interesting because you know I think the same thing played out with smoking a few years ago where you know people got to the point where they started to know this is not good for me it's related to like lung cancer and all these kind of things but still a lot of people in the world still smoke and so there's a difference between awareness and mm-hmm. actual behavior and I think there are a lot of things that go into that but it's not just giving people the information there are tools like these devices that uh, if used the right way can help with some of these behavior change things but there are a lot of other elements that go into it as well to create Mm -hmm. kind of sustainable behavior change beyond just something like drinking a couple less glasses of wine in the evening Uh, but it's a nice example and it's a nice runway I think for people if that's what um, people attach to then mm-hmm. I think it's yeah it can only it, that can only be a good thing yeah exactly like if 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 all of this experimentation has really just led to me like drinking a couple glasses less a week I'm I'm calling that a win like, I don't think that's a bad thing um you know it's it is interesting though like otherwise I do actually find it sort of difficult to pull out a lot of useful data like I'm seeing interesting stuff but I'm not necessarily getting stuff that's actually actionable for me like as as an athlete as a person because I you know, everything's pretty like normal, I'm going to say on my stuff. And that's kind of like a weird thing to come to terms with of like, wait, what am I supposed to be doing with this? Like, what does it all mean? It's nice to have like a cool app on my phone, but what does it, what is it doing for me? And I'm not sure I've figured out an answer for that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an interesting one though, because there there is an expectation that perhaps there should be actions to take based mm-hmm. on But probably the optimal profile is that you're within normal ranges on these things. And that's probably a good indication that you over the years as kind of a diligent, experienced athlete has paid attention to the right behaviors and you're in a good cadence. And so if everything's normal, then you don't necessarily need to take actions. You already have the right actions lined up. (laughs) And so I think there's some nice like reassurance in that probably that that isn't like a sexy (laughs) marketing story to tell. Exactly. (laughs) It means it's probably working for you versus, you know, someone who is a novice and potentially hasn't learned those things. Their data maybe looks very different. So again, it's a very individualized like use case. But yeah, I think there's there's something probably something reassuring in the the normal profile, but (laughs) it's true. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. (laughs) Lacking the sex appeal of taking massive action, but it's definitely a positive. Um and on the note of massive action, I actually want to get your your take on my my theory of wearables is that like over the years, you know how there's always like those new goal setting articles that come out around the new year, like new year, new me. And I write a lot of them. So like I, I love a new year, new me article. But so many of them start with like tip number one is like take like the first step. And the first step always seems to be in these articles, like buy the new running shoes. Like if you want to become a runner, you buy the new running shoes. That's step one. And I will always argue that that is not step one. That's like step 10. Step one is like going out and walking, um, like literally just moving. Uh not, you know, hitting buy now on a thing. And I think people see like view wearables as that sexy first step because it's a fun thing that's showing up. You're like new year, new aura ring, new me. Um, but if that's the end of it, uh, that's, that's not really new anything. That's just now we have a measurement of it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I think in the example you mentioned, like even the, the most basic, basic step is like whatever shoes you have, put them next to your bed. So when you wake up in the morning, they're there and it's a prompt that you are going to go out and walk because they're they're there. And mm-hmm. it's just like those like behavioral nudges, I think, using what you already have. And, you know, when we talk about wearables, the interesting thing is probably 99% of us have a mobile phone, which counts our steps for us and can measure our sleep on an app, can measure our heart rate, heart rate variability if we have the right app. So we have these things for free already that if you're really passionate about collecting data, you can do that. I think it is there's potentially like a marketing hook or a social signaling thing in terms of wearing something on your wrist or your finger that shows I'm a person that cares about my health, performance, those Mm -hmm. kinds of things. And so maybe that's part of it as motivation, but it's definitely not necessary. I think there are some much simpler and probably easier thing and cheaper things uh, or ways that people can kind of uh, get started on this journey without having those. But if they are the thing that helps you get into it, then great. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily have to be true, though. You have things for free <laughs> that you are already own that you could use. 
Yep. And that's actually what I did because I, to be honest, I actually bought the aura ring a while back and admittedly I've had like phases of wearing it and phases of not wearing it. Um, but when I got it, I had like, I, you know, the price tag's pretty high on it. And I really, I was like, okay, I want this thing, but like, I'm only going to get it if I do my HRV in the morning every day for like three months. Like if I actually like am taking it using my phone, like not using the aura ring, Before I get it, I have to use that on my phone and like I have to actually like work with the data that I'm getting from that and like actually think about like what I'm doing before I decide to like get this thing that's also going to do, yeah, basically that, you know, plus some some bells and whistles. I mean, I can talk all day about how much I like the temperature reader on here and how it's like actually like I've I've been able to see my cycle for the first time in 10 years, which is pretty nifty. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely was very much on that. Like, okay, what's the free version I can do first to make sure that I'm actually like using this data for good, not just collecting it because I want to have a cool thing on my finger. Yeah. There's something really interesting in a uh, principle of product design that that makes me think of whereby if something's too easy, you just don't care about it. You have to add like some kind of friction into the process to help people care about it and actually know that they're willing to use it in the right Mm. way, uh, which sounds like what you did naturally. Um, But that's obviously counterintuitive, I think, to to most people. It's not necessarily built into these things. And so like that's something, again, with elite athletes that we would typically do in terms of like helping them be engaged in the, the process. Because mm-hmm. if you're just collecting data and giving it back to them, then they're not going to change anything. They're not necessarily interested. There's like a step where they need to invest and like show willingness to, you know, engage in this process. And so I think, yeah, that's that's helpful for people in terms of like long term engagement with the data. If you can find ways to do that yourself in the absence of them existing within the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. the kind of ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Now. Is there any wearable stuff or any of these, like any data point really that you're particularly like intrigued with lately? Because it seems like every week I'm seeing new stuff come out, right? Like last year, I would say like the Aura, the HRV, like all of HRV was like, so 2021, 2022, I feel like we've started to get kind of like CGM sort of like became popular. 2023, I'm seeing all these patches now, like temperature patches, sweat rate patches, um, so it seems like we're just we're just going deep on the wearable. Like I was realizing for this article, I could just have my arm just covered in different patches and CGMs and like bands and everything. And it would be kind of an amazing image, but also like terrible to live with. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything that's like intriguing you right now? Yeah, you're becoming a cyborg. Um, I, honestly, the, the um, human physiology doesn't change as quickly as trends in hardware and companies. (laughs) And so as a physiologist or a sports scientist, I think we'd still, we'd still say the important things are still the important things. HRV is still important. Um, But generally this hat, this one hasn't been released yet, but I know is in the works and it's folks working on continuous and non-invasive blood lactate measurement, Ooh, which when assuming that works well at some point in the future I think that one will be incredibly interesting for Mm -hmm. athletes to monitor training training response those kinds of things uh so that's one I know there'll be a lot of interest in certainly as well as potential kind of caveats or concerns around accuracy those kinds of things uh so that one's really interesting I think another one that is coming up right now there are a couple of devices in the work starting to measure it is blood pressure as well from a from a health perspective. Okay. There are a couple of um like ring kind of devices, wristwatch devices that are in the works of kind of prototyping validation, not perfect yet, but people working on those that's interesting. Uh another one is cortisol and stress hormones. And again, mm. similar caveats in terms of accuracy, those kinds of things. Um, but potentially, you know, some some interest there in the future. And so these are probably things that are not necessarily available 2023, but in a few years down, down the road, potentially they will that be. That is interesting, yeah. Yeah, and I think the other thing from a, a sleep perspective that's interesting and has existed in, and does exist in different devices right now are head-worn devices that measure Ooh. your brain activity because those signals typically give you a more accurate reading in terms of um, when you're actually sleeping versus when you're just lying down trying to mm-hmm. sleep. And so there are starting to be some kind of in-ear devices, kind of like earplugs 
that are able to measure your brain activity at the same time as you know functioning almost as as earplugs and so they'll, they'll go from being devices right now that are like quite clunky that sit on your head and do the same thing but you know just quite cumbersome to much smaller much less invasive devices that measure the same thing and are kind of you know it's earplugs or it's an eye mask that you would generally wear anyway so yeah, I think okay. there's a there's a few trends there there's like different things that we'll be able to measure and then they'll just be like more comfortable less invasive more minimalistic that kind of thing so those are general trends kind of across the board but I think that one is an interesting one for for sleep mm-hmm. yeah for sure I really, I really enjoy that you're, you're so in this world, but still have such a good like grasp on kind of the, the nuance, the context, like you're not trying to kind of push any one of these things, because I think it's very easy for researchers, especially like exercise physiologists. It does feel like a lot of them kind of fall into going to, you know, R and D for a company and like kind of following the party line about them. So I really do appreciate that you have like a very nuanced view, even though you are like in this, in this industry and it'd be very easy to kind of jump to, you know, into like one of the techs or the other and like kind of say, this is, this is the right one. I like, I love that you're just like, no, there's nuance to all of this. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's, it's sort of, again, like context specific, individual specific. I always just encourage people to define what your kind of key questions are and to understand what you're trying to achieve. And then, yes, there's probably a solution for you, but there's almost like this decision tree process. And there's also like the main thing for me is more so transparency in terms of we can make this choice, but just be aware there are these potential limitations or just things to pay attention to. And so there's no like perfect solution. I'm not sure that there ever will be. I think it's just people being aware and being able to make informed decisions. Mm-hmm. And like that's almost the service. And, you know, just the tricky thing with with companies and those kinds of things is like some of them are great. They will publish data and they will be very transparent, but we can't rely on that across the board. And so just for people to be aware of that um, and then, yeah, just so they can kind of make their own informed decisions, I think, is is important because it can be hard. I know certainly for people who, you know, in my inner circle who have like a very different educational background you know, I wouldn't necessarily know what to go to in, in their exper- area of expertise. And so just helping people kind of navigate that space from a place of like understanding things a little bit better, I think is important. Yeah, for sure. And you've mentioned a few different times sort of this idea of also like going to experts for help, whether it's a sports psychologist, coach, you know, dietitian, all that stuff. And I think that's also maybe what's missing in this whole wearable conversation is, you know, it's really hard for the average person to even parse the data that is coming in, even even if it is in this like easy to read format, um, you know, it's still really helpful to be talking to a, a coach or or a sports psych or a dietitian about like how you can actually use this data to improve. And I think like, if you're just trying to kind of figure this out on your own, and you don't have any kind of like sports physiology or any of this background, I think it's really hard to take this data and actually action it in a way that's going to move the needle in a good direction versus uh, a way worse one, right? Like there's a, there's a different, like, I'm trying to think of how to say this, like your readiness score could indicate that like you're, you know, it kind of makes you think like, oh, today I should be doing high intensity because it says that I'm like ready to go today, even though today was a rest day. And now you go out and do like an extra, like three CrossFit workouts because it told you to. Uh, or because you think it told you to rather than just reading that and thinking, oh, cool. I'm like in a good place. I'm like ready for my workout tomorrow. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's, yeah, it's a really good point. Because uh, I think a lot of the ways these devices can be adapted is it helps you train like an elite athlete. But if I think about it, all the elite athletes that I know that are using these devices also have a coach, also have a sports psychologist, also have a sports scientist helping them interpret the data. And so those folks aren't necessarily so readily available to members of the public. I know that. But I think, again, it's just kind of a caveat or transparency around like <laughs> that potentially marketing advice in terms of like the device may not do that for you by itself. You should also, you know, potentially seek out some of these other folks or seek out just some kind of more education or more kind of advice in in those areas, because on its own, I don't think it's not necessarily set up to do that. Perhaps some point in the future that will exist. But for now, I think having those like expert humans in the loop will be the best way to interpret this information and to kind of make the best decisions for you and your training in your life. 
Exactly. Now that I'm thinking about the the cyborg qualities of having like my arm covered in things and thinking about like now my thing is so smart that it can tell me what to do for training. Now I'm like, we're, I'm wondering if I should just ask chat GPT how I feel in the morning instead of actually like thinking about it. Just let AI write my write my journal for how I'm doing in the morning. Just completely yeah. outsource I mean, that everything. Would, that, would, that would be a good experiment. Some of the interesting experiments that have been done or are starting to be done in sports science is actually the value of like a coach or someone who knows you making a decision based on like, you know, how you show up in the morning, like your body language, behavior, how you act, that mm. kind of thing versus the data. And so I think Love that's that. really interesting. Because if you ask like a partner in your life or a family member that was close to you, like how close would they get in comparison to the data and then like <laughs> what are the differences what can it what can the humans not see or what do they miss versus like what does the data miss and I think the hybrid of that is where kind of things will get better and improve in the future mm-hmm. yeah yeah exactly like there definitely is a place for all of this all of the the raw data like we love the raw data the raw data is great and if we can kind of pair that if we can pair the objective with the subjective data I think that's yeah that's where we really have like the best the best outcomes right like if all you were doing with british swimming was like reading the data and that was it there there would be no (laughs) nothing would happen i always say that like data is not just numbers it's also like behaviors it's conversations it's feelings it's emotions and what a good coach is doing is paying attention to all those things integrating those inputs based on their model of how they know you your typical behavior or when you're responding well to training and any differences when you might not be and making decisions based on that and some of the numbers as an input to that. Mm -hmm. And when they agree or disagree, there's something interesting there in terms of digging deeper. But I think with only one side of those things, you almost have half the picture. Exactly. So (laughs) then, yeah, you're missing a lot when you're making those decisions. Yeah, yeah. And for anyone who is using a wearable right now, I think think we both agree with this. the, The thing to try is actually wake up and before you open it to check your score, see if you can think like, think about what your score like what you feel like your score is and then see how it how it relates because I think that's at least one really good way of either catching the fact that it's not always going to be perfect or you know really just dialing in like how how did this feel and oh okay that was that was accurate cool that's that's how I'm actually feeling and I think it just gives you a much better perspective on yourself instead of just you know yeah like you say race day you're checking your thing and you're like oh crap i didn't sleep i'm going to do terribly even if you woke up and before you looked at it you would have been like you felt good feel yeah. pretty good <laughs> maybe yeah. just don't check it on race day like maybe we can just say that it's not going to yeah. do you any good yeah i definitely recommend that to people or if you can get to a place where you check it and you feel good no matter what like the score's bad and you're like screw it i'm still going to go and crush this race like that even <laughs> makes makes you stronger because you know you can like, like it almost depends on how you're who are your personality which is another thing again that these devices aren't necessarily taking into account like are you someone who's super anxious or are you someone who can use that as like fuel for good and be like damn it i'm gonna prove this device wrong you know Mm -hmm. and so like if you take that into account i think yeah that's another factor in terms of how you potentially want to use it Mm -hmm. ah so good okay is there anything else that we have not covered as far as like the nuance of wearables i feel like we got into all the different directions which i'm so excited about (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking, we will see a lot of these things improve over mm-hmm. time in terms of, you know, the things you're able to measure, how big they are. So you won't have them all on your arm at one point in time. They will be smaller, more invisible, which is good and bad. And the education around them like will improve, but probably, you know, at a slower pace than is is needed for some of the challenges that we have right now. So what I always just encourage people to do is kind of be, I guess, be optimistic and and curious about it but also skeptical in terms of if something seems too good to be true or doesn't make sense like that's where you want to dig in and ask more questions maybe seek out someone who has expertise in this space and just kind of run through some of these questions with them don't just trust the numbers that are being put in front of you just be kind of skeptical be curious about them don't trust the instagram (laughs) ad at (laughs) at a glance yeah there's i think that there's a lot of good here and there will continue to be a lot of good but there's also some things to just to be aware of and to be curious and, and be skeptical about so the more transparency mm-hmm. we can have about those the better i love that and you are sharing a lot of that stuff over on twitter so maybe just tell everyone where they can find you and follow along as you're kind of looking at some of the stuff as it comes out 
Sure. Yeah. So I'm just trying to share kind of new scientific discoveries, new observations from my own data, everything like that from the wearables world. Uh, so my Twitter is Dr. Sean Allen. So D-R-S-I-A-N-A-L-L-E-N. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting. This was so much fun. And I love all of the work you're doing. I find it fascinating. Yeah, this was a really fun conversation. I can't wait to read your articles and see the results of your cyborg experiment. <laughs> the great cyborg experiment. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you want to hear more training, racing, and endurance sport advice, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at consummateathlete.com for a weekly dose of inspiration and advice straight to your inbox.